By what name are you known? There are some who call me... Tim. Welcome to another episode of Timmy Talks, the channel where we talk old school magic. And today we are back from the Urborg Alliance Plains Pillage, the old school tournament in Dusseldorf, Germany. And we have reached this second round. And in the second round, we're going to look at local player Michael from Germany take on Dutchman Edo. And Michael is playing a blue, white, green aggro control deck. And he is taking on a very interesting brew called Goblin Kong by Dutchman Edo. Now, before we go to the actual deck tech, I would just like to point out that if you want to go straight to the games, you can check the description below. There you will find several timestamps and you can click on a timestamp that says take me to the games and that will take you straight to game number one. Here we are going to continue with the deck decks and I'm going to start with the deck of Michael. And here we see the deck of Michael. Now by looking at it at first glance, I would say this is your typical Urnum Ganon deck. What an Urnum Ganon deck wants to do, play out mana dorks in the form of Llanowar Elves or Birds of Paradise or play out a Mox or a Sol Ring. Anyway, ramp your way up to a bigger creature like an Urnum Jinn or an early Savannah Alliance or maybe even a Sarah Angel. And then after you've played your bigger creatures, you are going to play an Armageddon, making sure that your opponent cannot play out anything anymore. And you have the bigger creature and you can simply deal tons of damage and win the game. That's in a nutshell, that is what Urnum Geddon is about. Now, we see a lot of Urnum Geddon ingredients in this deck, but we also see some differences. And we've, we've seen these differences with other decks. For example, Dead Guy Ale, Troll Disco. Basically, what happens is that players look at these decks, they take the base from the deck, and then they add blue power. That's usually the first step. And then they start tweaking it, adding a few restricted cards, you know, maybe making some different choices. What's interesting, for example, at Michael's Brew is that he's chosen to only play with one Sylvan Library. A lot of times these decks have more Sylvan Libraries. He is all, all, also uh, only playing with two Armageddons. A lot of times these decks tend to have three Armageddons. Of course, he does play with a Demonic Tutor. So Demonic Tutor, of course, allows him to look everything up. So that that it, it's almost like he's still playing with three Armageddons, if you know what I mean, because he has that extra card, that Demonic Tutor, that's basically every other card in his deck. Um, another interesting point about this brew are the two Icy Manipulators. You don't see it that often in Urnum Ganon. Urnum Ganon decks tend to go maybe for Winter Orb sometimes and then have an Armageddon after that. Um, so it's it's interesting to see the Icy Manipulator. I think Icy is a very strong card, um, but I am curious to see how it's going to perform in this strategy. What I also like always to see is when you're playing Armageddon that you also have enough artifact removal. So he's playing with four disenchants. That's of course is important because you can destroy your opponent's lands, but if you can still generate mana with the Moxon and, and the Soul Ring uh, and maybe even a Felwer Stone, then you still have a problem. So it's always good to have Armageddon's and a way to get rid of artifacts. That's good to see. Another thing I like about this deck is the two side blasts. Uh, because what happens sometimes is these Urnum Ganon decks, they tend to do a lot of combat damage and then the game stabilizes and they just don't make it. The opponent is still on three or four or five life. They just cannot finish it. And then it's great to have some direct damage in your deck to kind of do business and finish your opponent off. So that's good to see. Another card, personal fav my favorite card in this list is the Stormseeker. I think Stormseeker is a beautiful card. I do understand why not a lot of people play with it. I, I mean, you know, it, 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 it's not a great card um, from a competitive standpoint, but it is a good card and it is another way to deal direct damage. It's an instant. You can play it after your opponent has drawn their card so you can deal that extra point of damage. So potentially you can deal eight damage and also in combination with Armageddon, you know, you can have a situation where you play an Armageddon and your opponent has no lands, no mana to cast anything. So that hand is going to be chuck full. And then after a couple of turns of your opponent filling his hand, you can play your Storm Seeker and deal a lot of damage. And when you already have an aggro deck like this, seven damage, eight damage can be definitely lethal. So interesting to see this, uh, this different version of Urnum Geddon. So I've called this UWG Aggro Control. Now let's take a look at the deck of his opponent. Let's take a look at the deck of Edo. And here we see the deck of Edo Goblin Kong. And 
It's quite an interesting brew. It's a goblin deck, but it's not mono red. It's got green and blue in here. And uh, of course, we've, we see the blue power, but we also see unstable mutation, for example. We see mind bomb. This is a very aggressive deck. So it's it's a weenie deck, I guess you could say. And, you know, it's got giant growth, got unstable mutation. So as soon as you've got a creature out, you can pump it up. It also has a full play set of chain lightnings, a full play set of lightning bolts. So there is a lot of damage jam packed in this deck. And what I find really interesting is as soon as they see a goblin deck that plays with green, I always think Scar Scarwood, Scarwood, Scarwood Goblin. I think that's the way you pronounce it. It's one green and one red to cast. It's a two, two from the dark. And it's like your perfect goblin for two, like a two, two for two. That's a goblin for a lot of old school goblin players. That is kind of the dream because you're you're missing that two drop in a goblin deck. And, you know, you see some people even playing Brass Claw Orc as their two drop in goblin decks. Now, um, it's interesting here that Edo hasn't chosen to go that route. Instead, he said, you know what, I'm going to play with four Kurt Apes and hence the name Goblin Kong. Uh, and Kurt Ape, of course, is a very strong creature. I remember when I started playing Magic back in, in Revised, uh, you know, Taiga Kurt Ape was a serious thing. People would open with that, and that was a serious threat. And I guess it still is. If I look at this deck, if Edo can have a quick opening, then it's going to be really difficult for Michael, even though Michael is also playing with a quick deck. So these are two pretty quick and aggressive decks that are going to battle against each other. So that's going to be very interesting. And um, yeah, the question is, and and, and and I'm now talking after sideboarding, the question is, is Edo going to board in his red elemental blasts for the blue power that Michael has? Uh, I also see that he has uh, flash fires in his sideboard. I mean, I really like flash fires. So I'm curious to see if he's going to use that. He also has city in a bottles in his sideboard. Does that mean when he board in his city in the bottles, he's going to board out his Kurt Apes? So I think when I'm looking at this deck, I'm already wondering, what are you going to do in game two, Edo? Um, anyway, this is the deck of Edo Goblin Kong. I think is very original, and I'm curious to see how it's going to stand up against uh, Michael's deck. Let's go to the games. Game number one, and we've got Michael sitting on the left, Edo on the right, and there we see the opening hand of Edo, so I think I saw a chain, Goblin Balloon Brigade, I saw Goblin King, I saw Mind Bomb, so it's looking pretty good here. And there is the hand of Michael, and it looks like he just took a mulligan, putting one on the bottom, keeping it there, and I think I saw a Sylvan, which is always pretty nice to start with. So he's first going to draw, and then Taiga into a Goblin Balloon Brigade, beautiful black bordered one. There we see a Savannah, and there is a Sylvan Library. Only playing one copy, but he's found it early in the match. That's what you want to see. And there he takes his first damage. And we see a Goblin Balloon Brigade. And I guess I didn't see a Mind Bomb then in his opening hand, or else he would have played it. And look at that. He's taking four damage, going down to 15. I'm sure Edo is pretty happy with that, having an aggro deck himself. And there we see a Mox Pearl. There we see a Tundra hitting the board. Let's see what else is he going to do. Attacking here with the 2-2. Two -two. That means Edo's going to drop to 18. Drawing a card here. Playing a City of Brass. Paying 3. And there's the Goblin King. And now he has two 2-2s. Two but there is a quick Swords to Plowsiers. So that means at least he's going to go back up to 19 again. Let's hope he remembers Look like it looks like he's forgetting to take life for uh, the swords to plowsiers there. Should have gone to yeah. Now he's doing. He goes to nineteen, and we see Michael checking out his first couple of uh, the three cards again. I mean, with the Sylvan, deciding to only pick one, not taking the extra like he did in the previous turn. Attacking again with the two two, dropping to seventeen, playing a lot of elves, passing turn here. And let's see what Edo is going to do. Attacking, not giving them flying, so that's interesting here. Willing to trade. Michael doesn't want to trade. There's the Mind Bomb we saw earlier. And uh, that means he can choose. He can take three damage or he can discard a card. For each card that he discards, he takes three damage less. So look at that. He's discarding a Disenchant, taking two damage, going down to nine. And there's also a Chain going down to six. And there's an extra chain going down to three. And now he's passing turn. 
Ooh, personally, I don't know what Edo has in hand, but I always like to kind of use it, use my chains and bolts as finishers. Because now you know that Michael's going to keep his uh, factory at bay here. He's going to use it as a blocker, probably. Then again, I don't know what Edo has in hand. And of course, he can make his uh, Goblin Balloon Brigades flying. That's probably the reason why he's deciding to play out an IC Manipulator using his factory to cast the IC. And we see regrowth. Okay, now it makes sense. Now I understand why he played out his two chains. He probably had the regrowth in hand already. Taking back, regrowing his chain, and that's it. That means game one is going to Goblin Kong. Game number two is about to start, and I guess it's going to be Michael on the play since he lost that first game. And uh, there you could really see the power of these red decks. It's just to burn as soon as you're like on, on nine, sometimes even 12. You can just get killed by a bunch of chain lightnings and, uh, you, know, you, you know, the regrowth, getting them back and everything. That's also the reason why you see in these decks usually a time twister as well that can do a lot of work. And there we see the opening hand by Edo. Looks pretty good as well. I think I saw a Mox. Then the, uh, the hand of, of Michael was a little bit too high for us, us to see. I guess he's still on three life, by the way, so that his life counter should definitely be on 20. Look at this opening, quite nice here. Black Lotus into an Urnum Jin. So Urnum Jin turn one, and this is a problem. We do see a really cool classic opening from Edo as well. A Kurt Ape here with the Taiga. That's a classic. That means he's got a nice two, three creature. But unfortunately, wow, and this is just brutal here. Swords to Plowsteers and a Strip Mine. So Edo is back to zero permanence. And there is some damage incoming here. That means Edo is ending up at 18 after taking the life from the Swords and then the damage from the Urnum again. And this is actually pretty nice. Um, he's actually kept the Sapphire because he wanted to play it at the same time to be able to play his Time Walk, taking the extra turn, playing a Strip Mine. The thing is, though, he needs to find an answer for the Urnum Gin. That is basically the most important thing here. Um, the Urnum Gin needs to be neutralized. And that is difficult because Urnum Jin has a toughness of five. And I mean, if you play old school, you play against Urnum Jin a lot of times. And it is just, it is just difficult. A creature with five toughness is really hard to kill. Four toughness is hard, but at least you've got some options. But that five toughness makes it really difficult. And especially when you're playing with red, it almost always means a two for one. And let's see if Edo can do anything against his Urnum. He's taking four damage now, dropping down to 14 and uh, we did see two city in a bottles in his sideboard so i wonder if he boarded those in since he's still playing with the kurt ape i don't think he has and he's playing another goblin now a 1-1 mountain walker not very relevant at the moment at least it gets uh force walk as well i guess from the urn of Jin. But does he really want to attack right now? Maybe he just needs it to jump. I mean, he's on 10. Okay, I guess he's attacking. He's figuring out, hey, I've got a goblin deck. Goblins attack. It's what they do. And using his Loa to activate his factory. Attacking right now. Lightning Bolt on the factory. Taking 4 damage. And that Urnum has really done tons and tons of work in this match for Michael. Oh man, and Sidney and Bottle would be so fantastic right now for, for Edo. Can you imagine him now casting a Sidney in the Bottle? If he hasn't boarded it in yet, I'm pretty sure it's going to board it in for game number three. He's on six, not playing out anything. So, I mean, this game looks pretty over, but you never know. Going to drop to two here. There's his event alliance and pass turn. And that's it. Okay, so that is game number two. This this game was decided very quickly with that crazy good start from Michael. And there was simply no answer from Edo. And that's that's where you really miss white. I can imagine Edo really missing white or at least missing black for terror or something. Like white just has that one mana casting cost instant. And of course, I'm talking about Swords to Plowsiers that just fixes those openings. When your opponent has a quick opening like that, you can just fix it with one sword. How cool is that? Uh, but of course, that's not in Edo's deck. Edo's deck is very aggressive. And aggressive decks usually struggle 
when their opponent has a great opening, a great aggressive opener. Um, okay, this is game number two. And as you can see, the players are sideboarding again, making some tweaks. Let's give them some time to do that. And we'll catch back up, to the, uh, up with them in game number three. Game number three here, the decider, Michael versus Edo. And let's see, I believe it is Edo on the play, which is good for him because he's playing mucho aggressive. Look at that hand. I see Volcanic Island. Uh, is that a goblin? It was hard to see, actually. And there we see, oh, Ancestral Recall in the opener. And he can play it because of the City of Brass. And he's also got a Lunar Elves. He has two options. I think I would go for Lunar Elves first. And there we see a Goblin Balloon Brigade. So he did have a Goblin in his opener. Let's see what he's going to do here. City of Brass taking a damage. And oh, Savannah Lines. I actually did not see the Savannah Lines in his hand. Starting with the Savannah Lines. Interesting to see now if Edo is going to attack or not. Maybe Michael decided to keep uh, his Lunar Elves because of the possible Bolt. So let's see what's going to happen here. And not playing his factory yet. And I guess we're going to see... Ooh, another Savannah Lines. Lots of pressure. Remember, he still has that Ancestral Recall in hand. Wow, this is, this is going to be really tough for Edo. What Edo really needs now is an Earthquake or something. One Chain Lightning on Savannah Lines. And attacking or offering to trade again. But Michael has just taken the damage. Really nice signed Lanor Elves, by the way. I believe it's a beta. And let's see. And there is Mishra's Factory. Gonna swing in here for three. Edo's gonna drop to 15. I'm kind of expecting that recall any moment now. He's passing turn. I wonder what Edo's gonna do. He's gonna attack again, offering a possible trait. Maybe he has... And there we see, okay, Swords to Plows here. That means one life for Edo. I want to say maybe he possibly has something against that Mishra's Factory. And ooh, Red Elemental Blast to counter that Ancestral Recall. That is well done by Edo, but still he's in trouble because there is now five damage on the board if Michael decides to attack with everything. And why wouldn't he? animating the factory attacking for five there is a bolt that means he takes three so he goes down to 13. there is a strip mine and oh this is actually quite nice this could kind of bring him back in the game on the other hand remember michael gets to start now with a fresh hand untap everything and he's already ahead on board but i think it's it's a good option from edo it, it, it is a way for him to get back into this He's on 13, Michael's on 15. I mean, he can definitely still win this one. So nice Time Twister. And Time Twister, I mean, it works really well in, in, in Red Burn decks because you get, you know, you get your chains back, you get your bolts back. And that's what you want to do when you're playing aggro. There is a Mox Sapphire and pass turn. Untapped here by Michael. What is he going to do? Playing out a Savannah. And I guess he's just going to attack here. Who's going to play out something first? Taking a damage from the city. Play out an Urnum. And dealing three damage here. And there's an Unsummon. Nice. Nice to see that, actually. <laughs> Pretty cool. Well-timed Unsummon. I still wonder uh, if Edo boarded in his City of Brass. I mean, sorry, it says City in the Bottle. There we see a Chaos Orb and an Ancestral Recall. So, I mean... Pretty nice seven cards picked up by Edo, and maybe that will get him back into the game. Look at this, two goblins. Or I'm sorry, a Curd Ape, of course, and a goblin. And the Curd Ape is now 2-3 because of that Taiga, so he can block the Savannah Lines with it. And all of a sudden, things are looking much better here for Edo, but there is a Swords to Plows here. So that means Edo's going to go up to 12, but loses his best blocker. Only has a 1-1 one, one Goblin left to block. Attacking now, and he's going to trade it for the Savannah Lines. He is going to go down to 11. And there's a Disenchant. Aye, that is pretty nice. Remember, he still has that Urnum in hand. Playing a Savannah Lines. And this is a very swingy match so far here in game number 3. Who's going to take this match? Will it be Michael or will it be Edo? 
the goblins or the urnums. Tapping three here, where we see a goblin king. Okay, tapping four, and we see a card from the sideboard here, taking care of all the islands, a tsunami, including his own islands, by the way, losing two. Look at that! this. Wow, he's really cleaning up. Playing Tsunami, destroying, playing a strip mine, and playing a bolt. And there it is again. I mean, he still had enough land left. And maybe from that perspective, he should have killed the Lanower Elves, because then he wouldn't have had enough land anymore to cast the uh, the Urnum. And now Edo's going to seven. There's a tropical island. There is another Urnum. Oh, this is painful. He needs a city in a bottle. No, that's it. Ay, 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 ay. Ay, ay. There was a moment when Edo played the Time Twister and then that, that turn after the Time Twister or when he casted that Unsummon on Urnum where I thought, oh, he's getting back into the game because he drew really well casting the Unsummon, casting um, casting the Chaos Orb, finding the, the direct damage to take care of some of the, of the creatures of his opponent. I really felt that he was kind of getting back into it. Uh, let's see, he's now selecting his sideboard cards. I'm really curious to see if he boarded in his city in a bottle. I don't think he has. And, um, I mean, yeah, it is a difficult decision because basically you would board in your city in a bottle for his city of brasses, and he's now showing it and his uh, his uh, his urnums. But I, I think personally I would have, just because urnums are four fives, they're so difficult to get rid of. Um, anyway, this was this week's episode, and this was round number two from the Urborg Alliance Plains Pillage. Thank you for watching another episode of Timmy Talks, the channel where we talk old school magic. Now, if you want to support the channel, um, you can do it very easily. Leave a like, leave a comment, subscribe if you're not a sub yet. That is really appreciated. And you can also become a sponsor of the show, so you can support Timmy Talks, and how can you do that? You can do that by becoming a patron on Patreon. So there's probably a card showing up right now. Click on that card, and that will take you straight to Timmy Talks' Patreon page, where you can support your favorite YouTube channel. Well, I don't know if I'm your favorite YouTube channel, but anyway, you can support me, and it's fantastic. Uh, talking about Patreon and patrons, let's go to the end scroll, and let's take a look at the fantastic, the amazing patrons of Timmy Talks. Ik het als fikker te samba kazing.